Welcome to Pharmacology by Lecturio. I'm Dr. PJ Shukla, and we're going to be talking about drugs and diabetes today. When we talk about drugs and diabetes, let's start off talking about how insulin was discovered. Let's go back to Canada in 1921. There were four important individuals who, which led to the discovery of insulin. The first was Frederick Banting, who was a physician studying at the University of Western Ontario. The second was a man by the name of James Collip, a brilliant biochemist at the University of Alberta. J.J.R. McLeod was a physiologist who was, who was uh, working at the University of Toronto. And finally, Charles Best, who was a medical student at the University of Toronto. Now, Charles Best lost the lottery in terms of which job and which research uh, project he was going to be working for. When he found out that he was going to be working for Frederick Banting in the summer of 1921, he actually tried to give away his research uh, clerkship to somebody else. That other medical student ended up taking a more popular position, relegating him to the ranks of people we don't know anything about. Charles Best then kind of said, okay, I'll work with this guy. We know that he's kind of mean and mean-spirited, but I'll work with him. Together, they isolated insulin and revolutionized the way we look at diabetes. Prior to 1921, everybody who had diabetes died. These discoveries would not have happened without James Collip, who was the biochemist, who actually helped them synthesize and isolate this uh, important chemical, this important hormone. So let's talk about insulin and how it works in the body. In the liver, it increases glycogen synthesis and decreases protein, protein catabolism. Now, it uses a porter called GLUT2 to move sugar into cell membranes. There is increased synthesis using pyruvate kinase, phosphofructokinase, and glucokinase. In the skeletal muscle, insulin increases glycogen synthesis and protein synthesis, and it uses the porter GLUT4 into the cell membranes. And in the adipose tissue, it increases triglyceride storage and decreases protein catabolism. It uses the porter GLUT4 and moves, uh, in, uh, moves sugar into cell membranes. Uh, there is increased synthesis and activity in adipose tissue under the influence of ins insulin, and we use an, uh, a hormone called lipoprotein lipase. Now, these are things that I want you to remember because these are things that do get put on exams because insulin is so important. Um, the makers of exams want to make sure that you know the ins and outs of how it works. The first of the oral medications that I want to talk about are the secretagogues. Now, secretagogues are the oldest oral class in diabetes. They increase insulin secretion. It is associated with weight gain and hypoglycemia, however, so there are some downsides to this particular medication. Now, the first generation secretagogues really aren't used anymore, and I don't really encourage you to, to learn too much about them at this point in time. The second generation uh, secretagogues are going to be the ones that you will be uh, asked about on your exams, so it's important to know or at least recognize these names. The third generation uh, of insulin uh, secretagogues are um, very much uh, coming into its own forte in clinical practice. Um, and right now we use them perhaps 5 or 10% of the time, but I think in the future we'll start to see them being used much more often. So how do secretagogues work? Well, let's take a look at that GLUT2 uh, glucose porter at the uh, luminal surface of the cell membrane. This glucose transporter moves glucose into the cell. Now, the glucose is going to be used for metabolism, obviously, and it eventually gets broken down and converted into ATP. Now, ATP is going to act on the potassium channel. Now, when the potassium channel closes, the cell is depolarized. Sulfonylurea drugs block and close and depolarize the cell membrane. Now, when you have a depolarized membrane, you're going to have more calcium influx into that cell. The depolarization opens up that calcium channel and allows lots of calcium to move in. So now you have more calcium inside the cell. When you have more calcium inside the cell, those calcium ions can form bridges between the vesicles that contain insulin. So you have 
calcium-mediated exocytosis of insulin, so you have more insulin secretion. Now, if your beta cells aren't working and you're not making insulin in the first place, secretagogues are not going to work. Let's move on to the biguanides. Now, the biguanides are the mainstay of diabetes treatment. They are first line, they're the most important drugs, and they're the most commonly used drugs. The other beautiful thing about biguanides is that they're cheap. So remember that they are first line therapy, they're cheap, effective, and very safe. There is a couple of um, advantages to the biguanides. They actually work by increasing insulin sensitivity. So they work really well with those type 2 diabetics. And when you get out into clinical practice, you're going to re realize that the type 2 diabetics are by far the majority of the patients that we deal with. The other nice thing about the biguanides is that they actually reduce endogenous insulin production. And the reason why that happens is because you don't need as much because the insulin is more efficient. Remember that insulin itself has some negative properties to it. So having hyperinsulinemia in diabetes is not necessarily a good thing. It actually prevents the development of diabetes in patients who are prone to it. So if you have a person who has moderately elevated sugars or impaired fasting glucose, and you put them on metformin uh, or other biguanides, you actually reduce the chance that they will progress to full-blown diabetes in the future. It is also used to restore fertility in anovulatory women, so it is used in infertility treatments. Let's talk about side effects. Now, normally when I talk about side effects, I talk about bad things that happen with drugs, but I want to mention something that's really important with the biguanides, and is they do not cause hypoglycemia. And this is an important distinction between biguanides and other drugs. And in fact, hypoglycemia is a really bad thing in diabetes. I always say to my patients that hyperglycemia kills in the long term and hypoglycemia kills in the short run. So it's important that we avoid hypoglycemia in our patients because patients who become hypoglycemic are actually at increased risk of developing uh, arrhythmia. So biguanides do not cause hypoglycemia. Now you can get lactic acidosis in certain patients, particularly those who have renal disease, liver disease, and respiratory disease. Let's take a look at the profiles of the different types of insulins that are on the market today. So the rapid-acting insulins, sometimes called the ultra-rapid-acting insulins, are usually given at mealtime. There's three different major groups of rapid-acting insulin. There's the aspart insulin that peaks at 10 to 20 minutes. There's Lispro insulin that peaks at 15 to 30 minutes. And there's glulysine insulin that will peak a little bit later at about 20 to 30 minutes time. The short-acting insulins take a little bit longer, but they're sh still considered short-acting. These are the oldest of the insulins, and we call them regular insulins. Um, trade names include humulin and novelin. They peak at around 30 minutes to 60 minutes, and they last up to, uh, up to, four, to 4 to 12 hours. The intermediate insulins last generally in the 12-hour range. They peak at about 1 to 2 hours. We call them intermediate insulins, NPH insulins. The long-acting insulins are the newest insulins out there, and they're really starting to become a mainstay of uh, in insulin therapy. Detamir insulin peaks around 60 to 90 minutes and lasts about 24 hours. Glargine insulin doesn't really have a peak time, or at least that's what the marketing information says. There is a bit of a spike at around 3 or 4 hours, but it's not really a clinically relevant spike. It's only relevant on a pharmacology chart. But from a practical point of view, it doesn't really have a peak time, and it also lasts about 24 hours. There are actually new insulins out there that are super long-acting insulins that now last about 36 to 48 hours, and we will briefly mention them today. As time goes on, they're going to become more and more important. Let's talk about the concept of glycemic excursion. So glycemic excursion really means the difference between the level at the start of ins at the start of a meal and at the end of a meal. So if you take a look at your breakfast excursion, that is the largest excursion of the day. Even though lunch and dinner may be larger meals, there's not as much of an excursion. 
This is going to be really important when we start to prescribing insulin. I mentioned to you before that we do have some novel insulins out there. The ultra-long-acting insulins have just come onto the market in the last probably eight months. Glargine modified insulin has a very, very long duration of action, probably around uh, 36 hours. Now, I also want to talk about inhalational insulins. The, the, these very first products were very unsuccessful, unfortunately. You can see the first puffer was really more like a huge beer can than really a puffer. It was quite inconvenient. It had the spacer built into the, the device, um, and it wasn't as successful, and it ended up getting pulled off the market because of uh, various reasons. There are new insulins out there that are much smaller and perhaps a little bit more palatable, and we'll see if they, if they pick up and take off. Now let's just review the actions of insulin. The actions of insulin does not include decreased protein catabolism in myocytes, decreased protein catabolism in hepatocytes, decreased protein catabolism in adipocytes, and increased triglyceride storage in adipocytes. Which of these does insulin not include? Well, increased triglyceride storage in adipocytes. That's not a correct answer because we know insulin increases triglyceride. Decreased protein catabolism in adipocytes. That's not correct. Decreased protein catabolism in hepatocytes. And decreased protein catabolism in myocytes. So there you have the correct answer.